This is a special edition of Life and Times. I'm Pat Morrison with Ruben Martinez. We have invited Daryl Strawberry and Edward James Olmos as our special guests, along with others, to discuss what is happening in the city of Los Angeles and to send a message to the families in the city. If you are within reach of this program, you have probably smelled the smoke from our burning city. You have probably driven home on its empty streets and freeways, and you know that what is going on is an earthquake of sorts, a social upheaval of an immense magnitude. The whole world is indeed watching us, and this special edition of Life and Times is intended to reach all the people in your homes and on the street. In the middle of this crisis, this program is intended to appeal to the youth of Los Angeles, to their families, to their grandparents, to their friends, to stop the violence. Ruben Martinez is one of the many reporters who's been out on the street covering the youth and what they've been doing. We've all seen what's been happening, but you at ground level. Yeah. Since, since last night, um, we began at First Amy Church. Uh, it was an experience which, on the one hand, was very inspiring. There were a lot of messages calling for, for, for peace. Uh, uh, and for justice at the same time, there are a lot of calls for the police reform, uh, the passage of police reform. But the thing that really got me, uh, with in the middle of the choir singing, the, the inspirational music, uh, the journalists up, up at the front near the pulpit um, had a row of monitors. And of course, at about 8 o'clock in the middle of, of, of the service, uh, in the speeches, um, those row of monitors near the pulpit were showing uh, fires breaking out all over Los Angeles. And it was gut-wrenching because whatever the, uh, the message was that was coming from all the, the, the great leaders of, of, of Los Angeles speaking from the pulpit, it couldn't stop what was already set in motion, the incredible rage that was going out on the streets. A lot of people have talked about you know, this being a South Central thing or a black thing, but last night we clearly saw that it wasn't just that. Um, downtown, uh, where I was most of last night, uh, there were uh, mostly youth from all backgrounds, white, black, Filipino, uh, Latino. Uh, there were ACT UP activists. There were RCP, the Revolutionary Communist Party. Everyone was out there. There were working class kids. There were rich kids. And everything just fell apart. In the course of two hours, the city underwent two tremendous shocks. There was the first one of hearing the verdicts and the general sense of astonishment that these were all acquittals, that there were no guilty verdicts, even against the sergeant in charge of the scene, even against the officer accused of filing a false police report, which mm -hmm. compared to the Rodney King tape was like reading a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And the second shock sustained a couple of hours later when we saw the first of those fires. Mm -hmm. On television, it was juxtaposed mm -hmm. as the first AME church, mm -hmm. and on the other side of the screen, the city beginning to burn up. Right. The city falling apart like we've been talking about so much over the last three years. On the one hand, we talk about our great multicultural LA. On the other hand, we talk about the balkanization of of Los Angeles, people splitting apart, whether it's black Korean tension or black white tension, and it's all just boiled over completely at this point. Um, the language that's being used is very interesting. Uh, in South Central today, not just in South Central, but in Pico Union as well, in the Latino, as well as black communities, I must have heard the term the white man used um, probably more than I've ever heard it in, in a, such a short span of time. Um, and with a lot of anger. It was real. It wasn't posturing. Something was coming up from deep inside, something that had been locked deep inside and was completely out. Um, on the other hand, the other term that I, I see used a lot on television is they, meaning the people of the inner city, whether they be Latino or, or black, and some of whom, a minority of whom, I think, have been involved in, in, in the, the, the violence that's, that's been going on out there. It's this we, they. It's the separation and the distancing and the putting at arm's length. Right. It, when I said that the world is watching what's going on here, I wasn't kidding. I was giving an interview today to French radio. Uh, everybody in the office was being called by people they knew from this country and other countries. And President Bush at a press conference said this, it's outrageous what happened and we're all sickened by it. Mm -hmm. At first I thought he was talking about the verdicts. It turns out he was talking about the rioting and the looting. Had he said both, I think he would have been equally correct in it the eyes of many. It doesn't seem like any one leader has been able to strike the perfect note to hold back the force that's been unleashed here. And it's terrifying. <clears throat> Um, and just going out today, um, seeing places that we all know and love, people that we know and love uh, being destroyed, uh, entire neighborhoods are being set back decades, um, and there's loss of life. Um, 
the, the horrible sense of helplessness that I'm sure a lot of people have felt um, is that nobody has been able to come up with that one word or that phrase or that idea that will hold back uh, what's, what's been set in motion. And you must think Tom Bradley is looking at the city that he has helped to create and feels it falling apart in his, in his hands like so much sand. Mm -hmm. And in Simi Valley, they're on the defensive. The mayor is saying, this is not Simi Valley's trial. This is not Simi Valley's problem. We have not created it. Only two or three of the jurors are from Simi Valley. Right. But I think there's a very strong sense of people who are down in the city of Los Angeles, that these are the suburbs where people have fled to get away from the they that you're talking about. Mm. There is no we or they right now. The, the, the violence is spread uh, all over the, the, the inner city and into Hollywood. Uh, we're at the KCT studios in East Hollywood and, and there was looting uh, right outside. It's everywhere. It cannot be we or they anymore. It, it, it is all of us together. Um, at, the other, the other thing that I also wanted to comment upon uh, is that we have had a lot of good Samaritans. I, 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 I've seen all kinds of people uh, on the street helping each other. In Pico Union today, uh, a Korean store, furniture store, went up and uh, Latino uh, uh, neighbors manned the hoses. There's not been enough, you know, uh, uh, fire trucks to go around, obviously, and um, so uh, times, uh, people uh... have come together. We're going to go and take a look at a tape right now. We're talking about a situation in which our youth, perhaps more than any other segment of Los Angeles society, have been involved in. Um, it's a situation in which the youth have the most to lose, and perhaps the youth can, uh, can help us not lose so much. So we're going to look at the reaction from uh, the youth of Los Angeles on this tape. Let's roll it. Are you still coming to They'd have to go burning up everything to show where we was coming from, but then again, that wasn't right for them. To, I don't think the Rodney King trial was right. I think they should have proven them cops guilty. But then again, the black people shouldn't go terrorizing everything like they did. I don't think that's right either. We're going to make this thing work out. I hope so. We just got to reach our kids, man. That's it. We got to reach our kids and let them know there's a way to do it. You know, we don't want to solve it by acting like Officer Kuhn. We want to solve it through peaceful, passive nonviolence. What are you doing today? Just going around, watching everybody, watching all the stupid fools burning up everything, looking at all that stuff. Are you frightened? Yeah, in a way. Why? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, it's probably going to burn up over my house or something go, something going to catch on to my house or where my mother lives or buy a job or somebody in my family might get hurt or something. We want to take this opportunity to appeal to the young brothers and sisters, Latino and African American and Asian American and white American who are knocking out store windows and taking things home to remind you that these are the stores that we depend on to supply us with our goods in our community. Why do you think they burn McDonald's? Cookies. Oh, oh, trying to get back at the white people. Yeah. Trying to get, I trying think to they burn back. McDonald's because they um, trying to get back to the white well, people for what they did to Rodney King. That because they so because they didn't prove the cops guilty in their trial. So I think that's why they gonna burn McDonald's, thinking that's gonna hurt them. But it's probably gonna hurt them. But it's gonna hurt us too because a lot of us like to go to McDonald's. That's probably one of our fast favorite fast food restaurants. And they just don't think about that before they go burning up everything. Yeah. As you can see, all of us are affected by this. Um, I am reminded of, of a poem by the black poet about what happens to a dream deferred. Does it just sag like a heavy load or does it explode? And I think given that, some people can understand what's going on on the streets. The young people who are here with us today uh, perhaps could just as easily be out there themselves. They chose to join us here. They have their reasons and they will explain them to you. At first we have Shelley Henderson, who is an Occidental College student and with the Black Student Alliance there. We have Michael Lewis, who is a member of the First AME Church, which organized uh, prayer vigils and rallies around this event to keep peace. And John Cager, who is Minister of Youth at the First AME Church. Were there friends of yours out here, people you know? Why were they doing this? What did they tell you? In terms of the looting, it's funny. I got reports from parents and members of the church that we indeed had some young people who were involved in uh, in the looting of some of the uh, stores around the area near the church and being the kind of person that I am I confronted the young men who had been accused and none of them 
would own up to actually having participated in the uh, in the riot and in the looting. However, you know, I could look at them and see new shoes and, and new clothes and things of this nature. I think what has happened is that what started as an expression of, of pent up rage and, and a cry for justice has turned into mostly uh, an opportunity for greedy people greedy people and opportunists to take advantage of the yeah. situation. Yes. But how do you unring that bell? How do you talk to the young people you know, Shelley? Um, well, I've gotten myself into a position where I've um, just been letting people know that the violence is not helping. What we're doing in essence is destroying our own communities. When, all, when the last rock is thrown, when the last fire is put out, um, and we have to go back to live in our communities, we don't have anything. There's no warehouse to go to and buy tapes and CDs on rodeo. You know, there's no Burger King on Jefferson. And we're hurting ourselves. And I, I've just been trying to explain that, that that's what's actually going on. And we're, in a sense, giving the am ammunition to do it. It's taking, the police are overwhelmed right now. It's taking them anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours to arrive at the scene and so we're just doing it and no one's stopping it and it's just going to keep going on. But where is your anger, Michael? What do you do with your anger? Well, actually, I just put my anger aside and I, I try to help some of my friends that were, as John said, were, you know, looting. And I try to explain to them why, why would you want to steal, why would you want to steal something that doesn't even belong to you? I can't even I can't even put that in my mind. Why would I want to take something that doesn't even belong to me? Why would I want to burn somebody's store down? I don't even know the owner. Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to do that? Mm -hmm. John, I, I can gonna, understand. I'm going to ask you, at, at this point, a lot of us were at, were at First Amy last night, right. and like I was saying earlier, you know, there was a lot of impassioned pleas for, for right. coolness, for calm, for collected thinking. So far, none of these messages have been working. Why is that, and what messages missing for us to get back into control. Well, in your introduction, you, you hit upon a very cogent point. There's a lot of people out there talking about they're going to get back at the man, at the white man. Uh, they have 10, 15, 20 years worth of frustration built up inside of them. They don't realize that when they go and they torch that store on the corner, they're not torching the system or the white man. They're burning up somebody's dream. Right. They're destroying yeah. somebody's livelihood. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of what kind of message can we put out there to stop them, uh, what it what it takes is is some courage. Uh, the mm -hmm. people who the people who house the people who are out there looting need to tell them you're not going to go out there and loot. Yeah. You can't come in here if you're going to go out there and clown. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a just as the police officers in the Rodney King incident crossed the line in using excessive force. We, the people who are out in the streets now have crossed the line mm -hmm. in expressing their civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. So you don't fight their, their misconduct with your own misconduct? Is that what you're trying to say? Right. Uh, the Bible says an eye for an eye, but right now what we have is a life for an eye. They're going beyond the concept of an eye for an eye. That's mm -hmm. right. And vengeance is the Lord's. <coughs> Michael, what about the parents? Do you see something more that the parents in our communities can be doing? I mean, if a lot of kids are out on the street right now and they're not at home, is there something else that, that our parents can, can do? Well, I think that the parents should keep their children in the house because I don't see what a child, what a person my age could be doing out at this time of night anyway. They should be at home watching TV, doing, doing something homework. constructive. We have homework assignments that we could be doing over the mm -hmm. weekend, there are plenty of things that you can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can rent a movie just to stay out of trouble mm -hmm. because it doesn't make sense, like I said before, to go out and burn somebody's store. And that's in your neighborhood. You're making your own neighborhood look bad. Even though you may not like the person that owns that store, you may not like the way they treat you, but mm -hmm. you're just making your own neighborhood look worse. And when this is all over, our neighborhood is gonna look like trash. Mm -hmm. Everything is gonna be burnt up. and they're going to have to go out into another community. They're going to have to go farther and farther out to go buy groceries. Mm -hmm. They burnt I, down grocery the stores. The new Luckies that just opened this yeah. month in the Crenshaw yeah. District mm -hmm. is still standing. Yes. Mm -hmm. But one of the few. I think what, what needs to happen is there needs to be 
the, the reason people are going out and doing this needs to be addressed. I don't think it helps to sit and say, people are looting, people are doing this, bad, bad, bad. I think the, the answer would be in addressing why they're doing this looting and attacking those issues. Um, we're at a place now where, you know, people are coming, taking garbage bags, going into grocery stores, and uh, mothers are sending their kids out there, but I think we need to address why are they doing this. They're, they're in a situation of displacement. They have all this frustration, all this anger, and it's been built up. Tawana Brawley, Yusef Hawkins, uh, Latasha, Latasha Harlan. Harlan, and Rodney King. All this is things that have been built up and now they need some place to vent it. Well, and so we need something, another, a constructive way that people can vent out their anger. Mm -hmm. They're tired of being told to go vote. They're, they're tired of that. People have been told to vote. People have been told, hold on, have some faith in the system. Mm -hmm. It will carry itself through. It reminds me when I was little, you'd do a coin toss with your brother, he'd lose. Okay, two out of three. Okay, three <laughs> out of five. How long are people going to wait well, as for we the can justice see now, system to work? This, you know, People have lost their faith in the system, mm -hmm. as we can see in the streets of L.A. That's, there's a total lack of faith for the system because it seems that the system only works for certain individuals. So how do you keep hope alive, as, as, as Jesse Jackson said, so, has said so, to us so many times, in the face of that? Uh, that's one question to, to all of you, but also in terms of you know, our reaction as a community or as communities to what's been going on. Mm -hmm. There was kind of mixed <coughs> messages going out. Yes, of course, we're frustrated. We need to vent our frustration, was what mm -hmm. the mayor said. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, hold it in, let's do it, you know, in a constructive way. But that anger has boiled over. How do you keep hope alive and how do you keep that anger from boiling over? One thing that needs to occur is uh, we need to stop the political grandstanding. What we need right now right. is leadership from our political leaders. We need leadership from George Bush, not 20-second sound bites. We need leadership from Pete Wilson. Pete Wilson needs to come down here, not stay up in Sacramento and assess the situation from far away. Right. Exactly. Um, in terms of what we as citizens can do, again, it's people are basically good. Most people, when they take time to soberly reflect on what's happened, certainly as they wake up in the morning and they see the devastation to our community, people are going to be hurt. We sent mm -hmm. out cleanup crews this morning. Mm. Uh, the area around our church, uh, after you left First AME, the fires started and they're, they're, the whole area is devastated. We sent out uh, cleanup crews, uh, about 10 men and six uh, wreckers with dumpsters. Mm -hmm. They started cleaning up the area around the church and people from the community, when they saw them start, came out and volunteered. Mm -hmm. Just as you say, people helped put fires out, mm -hmm. people helped res rescue other people. Exactly. A Times reporter helped an Asian lady who was being beaten exactly. up. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but one of the questions that emerges is the sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't question. One Absolutely. of the jurors was interviewed today on CNN and was asked whether she thought their vote had triggered this kind of reaction. And she said, well, if we'd voted to, uh, to consider them guilty, people would have been out celebrating and caused the same kind of trouble. How do you go up against an attitude like that, that gives you no room to go anywhere? It's, um, I think you make a, uh, an excellent point. When you quote the juror, I could certainly sit up here and make uh, public my own impressions of the, uh, the attitudes of the jurors and my feelings that they were, that they had uh, prejudged this case before it was ever uh, yeah. started. Um, I think you have, in understanding the frustration that the people feel right now, you have to look back over the last couple of years what happened in Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, basically, two years ago, Don Jackson videotape showing a police officer forcing his head through a place, plate glass window. Uh, the officer was acquitted. They have uh, videotape Korean grocer shooting Latasha Harlan, murdering Latasha Harlan, shooting her in the back of the head. The lady gets probation, no jail time, $500 fine. They have uh, almost three minutes of uh, videotape footage of police officers beating Rodney G. King. Clearly, while he was down, unable to protect himself, the officers are acquitted. The people say, what do we need? What, what do we happen? need? When do we get justice? Maybe for the final word, we'll leave it to Michael, who I think is the youngest of the crew <laughs> before us. What do you, just take a, you know, a couple of seconds to give a final message to, to kids your age or a little bit older, a little bit younger. What's, what do you want to say to them? Well, the only thing that I would like to say to you is, why don't you just keep the faith in God 
and try and remember to pray. You must remember to pray. That's, that is the only way that you're going to make it today, as MC Hammer says. You need to pray to make it today. And that's all I'd like to say. Great. Terrific. Thank you for Thank being you with us. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to some phone numbers right now. Um, people are in need. You might be in need right now. The General Red Cross at 739-5200. At that 739-5200 is for shelter, meals, and first aid. You can also call the First AME Church at 735-1251. That's for shelter, for first aid, and general assistance in the South Central community. There's also a Red Cross station at the First AME Church, which is located at 2270 South Harvard Avenue. That's 2270 South Harvard Avenue near Adams. And finally, uh, there is the Los Angeles Relief Referral Service at 6860950. They will refer you to the emergency services that you, that you need. They will give you the phone number that you need for an emergency. Um, one last phone number here uh, will be for the, the general first aid info line. They can give you first aid information, hospital referrals. Uh, that's 1-800-559-5252. We have with us our next guest, and I think he's a familiar face to many in many of our communities in Los Angeles, Edward James Olmos, the director and principal uh, actor of American Me, that showed us an incredibly harsh reality in the prison system and the and Mexican mafia in the prison the system. The last time he joined us was under happier circumstances discussing yes, that was. film, and now we're here to discuss uh, some grimmer realities in the city of Los Angeles. Have you been out today? What have you seen? Yes, we have. Uh, I've been out in, in the community. and. Uh, trying desperately hard to uh, make people understand that hopefully if there's anyone out there that are listening to us right now that have <clears throat> relatives, brothers, sisters, loved ones that are out of the house right now, please get them home as fast as you can. Get them inside the house and have them there with you. It's very important that people understand that the National Guard is coming into the situation and anyone found out in the street after curfew is going to be in question. So. I pray that people will just go home and uh, everything will, will, none of the problems will be solved, but the looting and the danger of fire will stop because they will make sure that they get everybody that uh, is out on the street. Yeah, right. Eddie, in Pico Union, um, I was shocked, um, certainly, to see the amount of violence that, that came out today. It's a mostly Salvadoran some Mexican neighborhood. Um, I don't think many of us were expecting to see that kind of spillover. Of course, now it's everywhere, but the Latino community is involved there in Pico Union as well. Where do you think that came from? Were you expecting something like that? Uh, the situation is not really harnessed inside of the Rodney King uh, mentality of, of that. That's, that was just the last straw that, that gave the uh, the ability for the negative energy to materialize and to really play itself through. We've been, uh, for many, many, many years, leaders, many leaders have been trying to make uh, the society as a whole in tuned with the fact that there are certain needs that have not been gotten by the populace. And the, the, dif the distance between the have and the have nots is that uh, awareness. And you are seeing that in action right now. You're seeing people from, um, they would never do this kind of action out on the street behaving in this manner because uh, many of them have nothing and they see right now that everybody else is doing it so why shouldn't they and they go ahead and those that started it into the negative which were most of them were just very frustrated and very angry people but they were also with the intent in mind of saying this is a great opportunity to make this kind of a move and uh, that is what has happened and we see it every a lot and <clears throat> it's been funny because this is a truth that is hard for a lot of people to understand the behavior that is being exhibited right now which is one of violence one of uh, of uh, vigilantism one of uh, of uh, at the same time <clears throat> self uh, you know satisfaction of saying I'm gonna do this for me now I'm tired I can't take it anymore, this is it, this is for me. And they get together in a mass and they go out and do something negative. And everybody remembers very well the Boston Tea Party. 
and how wonderful that felt after it was over because they really took the initiative in their own hands. Well, welcome to the Boston Tea Party 1992 style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This okay. is a revolution. One of the, <clears throat> the themes in your film was the dysfunctional family. In a situation like this, how do you apportion responsibility between society, the social structure, the legal structure, and the family itself? Who has to step in and how far? I think both have to step in and both have to do it to the, the furthest extreme as possible to make sure that the child understands that it is loved and that they really matter. And that's the problem. I mean, how can a, a, a kid today, most of the people out there on the street right now are children under the age of 25. I consider anybody under the age of 25 to be someone that is just barely starting their life. They're children. They're starting. They're getting it together, even though they're young adults. And they, even though they're over the age of 21, they're still young adults and they're starting their lives. Uh, how can they feel as if someone cares for them, whether it be their own parents or uh, when they come from dysfunctional families and, and the economics are so low that the, even the father doesn't feel like he's portraying any kind of manhood whatsoever, you know, and he doesn't have that feeling. Uh, when they turn around and they see our, our leaders, our tremendous leaders in this country, doing simple, basic value dysfunctioning themselves. I mean, when a, how many of us sat around the television set at, at a dinner table and uh, without any malice, without any you know, f anger, anything, just out of sheer basic, said to the TV when we heard about the thousands and millions of dollars worth of bad checks that these people had written to the Congress and the Senate, and said to us, geez, you know, if I did that, I'd be thrown in jail, and kept on eating, and here the kids looking at it and hearing that, and then they're looking at the TV and seeing that the, the representatives, they didn't, no big issue was made out of it even though in a lot of houses there was a big issue made out of it. But still, most of us, General, had that just thrown out there. Bingo. I mean, what, did that, what signal was that to kids? Okay, what signal is, is it to kids when, when the SNL savings and loans companies are bailed out, but they won't bail out education in America? What is that all about? What, what, what condition are we in when they will go to Kuwait to getting back the land for the Kuwaitis and, and pour billions of dollars into making sure that they get their land back? and that we get control of our little situation, Ed, and there's no... desolation of the city. Eddie, just to switch mm -hmm. gears a little bit here, linguistically, quizás mm -hmm. podemos pasar al español un poquito, okay. porque yo sé que hay familias en el este de Los Ángeles y en otra parte de la ciudad, viendo este programa en este momento, eh, padres de familia, jóvenes, ¿verdad?, que están ahí, quizás que estuvieron en la calle hoy en la tarde, hay mucha rabia allá afuera, y es como una ola incontenible en este momento. ¿Cómo podemos arrestar esa obra de rabia. ¿Qué le podemos decir a nuestra familia latina? Porque la familia latina es fuerte. Ahí tenemos la abuelita, tenemos el, el abuelo, la, la madre, el padre, y luego los hijos. Somos una unidad familiar. ¿Qué podemos decirle a la familia latina? Ahorita lo, lo que podemos decir últimamente es decirles que ahorita en esta noche, especialmente esta noche, tenemos que recibirnos en entendimiento que tenemos que traer a todos nuestros uh, um, hijos y hijas y toda nuestra familia y ponernos juntos en una casa, unirnos, porque si están afuera en la calle, ahorita se va, va a ser un, un desastre. Ahorita va a salir el National Guard y últimamente lo que va a pasar va a ser increíble. And I'm telling you that from the bottom of my heart, that's mm -hmm. the only thing that I have been saying across this whole situation, is get home and if your children are out, Pray for them. May they come home very quickly because the National Guard is on the way out. And we cannot forget Kent State. I don't blame the National Guard. I don't blame the police department. God bless. Ojalá que su mensaje cae en orejas abiertas. I hope so, too. Okay. I think that uh, that's going to be about it for us this evening. Um, Ruben, you have some information about tomorrow and our Monday programs as well. Yeah. We will have, we'll be here tomorrow for our live edition. As always, we'll be discussion, discussing the same issue, of course. It's the only issue we want to discuss right now. Uh, and on Monday, we will have a live edition of Life and Times as well, a 90-minute town hall edition in which we will have many of the protagonists in this drama that's unfolding before us right now. Please stay in tonight. God bless. See you tomorrow night. This program was made possible by a grant from the James Irvine Foundation. 
which is dedicated to the development of an informed California citizenry.